my colleague in the Council of Ministers, Purandeshwari Ji, Dr. R. K. Pachori, Director General of Terry, Ms. Diana Markham, Library of Congress, USA, Professor Rajashekhan Pillai, Vice Chancellor Igno, Professor Balakrishnan, Associate Director, Indian Institute of Science. Dr. Debal Kar, fellow Terry, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate Terry and Igno for warming up the library space. I can assure Dr. Pachori that this warming up is not going to lead to any trouble at all. Um, actually, I shudder to think uh, to possess a pen drive with four million books. I mean, I think I'll soon become illiterate if I had that with me. I mean, I really love to read a book in my hands. I mean, there's, 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 you know, I connect to the print. I connect to the author. I, you know, I mark it. I can't do that in digital mode. So, you know, I really, though I agree that you have, you know, access to four million books, I mean, if I had 10 lifetimes, I wouldn't be able to read one million. So, and I think as we move digital, we should look at the problem a little more um, logically. Um, first of all, I don't want, I, you know, Mr. Balakrishnan, I do not want a digitization of the Orphans Book Act 2010. <laughs> you know, I shudder to think of have such an act. I don't want to look to find out when the author died. I am, I am, you know, not a writer of sorts, but I am an author myself. And the last book I published, you know, every, everything was taken away by the publisher. You know, see, author really never gets anything anyways. There's no point looking for the author as to when he died. You should better find out when the publisher went, was liquidated. <laughs> the publisher gets liquidated, you will have all the rights. <laughs> so maybe we should have some kind of legal stratagem to do that. Uh, no, but on a serious note, I think this is a very important issue. Uh, and I think we should look at it, other than the fact that there is under the Copyright Act a fair use clause anyway. And the fair use clause allows research institutions would allow libraries, uh, you know, would allow universities, would allow, would allow educational institutions to have access to this material anyway without violation of the Copyright Act. Uh, there is already a fair use clause, but I think we need to do more than that. Uh, and and I'll, I'll, presently, uh, I'll presently sort of put some of the issues uh, that, that I think are necessary to, necessary to be addressed. But, more, but most important of all is that we in India, and I think uh, a large section of mankind has a great opportunity here. Uh, if you remember when we, uh, when we started with the information technology revolution and we had these mobile phones, um, uh, you know, we got rid of the landlines. The normal, you know, landline phone is not something that we even think about. So in a sense, uh, there was a technology um, jump. We went straight away to mobile phones and, you know, didn't really bother about landlines at all. And so similarly, in, in, if, if we digitize um, uh, these, these books, we will be able to, you know, jump, have, through technology, uh, jump um, to an, uh, and provide space to the people of India, the less privileged, access to something that they would not have got access to for the next 50, 100 years. And I think this is the way we ought to look at it, because this will be applicable not just to vast populations in India, but also vast populations throughout the world. I mean, of the 6.2 billion people that are inhabiting planet Earth, I don't think more than 5.5 billion people have access to the kind of, uh, you know, uh, books that you're talking about. It's a very minuscule minority that has access to these books. And therefore, if you 
put them in digital form, you will give access, you will, you will empower, enable people uh, like never before in civilization. So I think what, what this does is, is gives us an opportunity. But I think digitization of material is one thing, but the more important thing is the, is, 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 is the problem that a young student faces today on the internet. You have enormous information on the internet. I mean, you know, it's a tsunami. It inundates you. And sometimes it's, 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 it's very, very, you know, you, you feel very concerned. Because you don't know what information is right, you don't know what information is wrong. And you, you sometimes wonder, do I have access to the right information? And so it's not just the issue of digitization of material. It is the issue of the relevance of that material. And therefore the real challenge in the, in, in the, in the decades to come is to, is to have development of software which enables you to access the kind of information that you want. And that's the real challenge and that's where there's a conflict between profit and non-profit. Because if you allow, you know, Google and others and other companies to actually do that, uh, this is a for-profit enterprise because they will not uh, consolidate information for user use unless they get some profit out of it. So you may have access to vast, you know, areas of knowledge, but that access will be useless to you because you're not, you'll not be able to access the kind of knowledge that you need. So in a sense, the dig the the digitization revolution should move towards uh, making, making the revolution user-friendly, just as everything else is happening in the world today. Because as we move towards healthcare, uh, you're, you're, you're really looking at the individual uh, genome. Uh, you're looking at the individual genetic makeup, and then you're trying to figure out to what diseases you may be um, uh, susceptible to, and your, uh, the treatment is based on your proclivities. And similarly, I think in the digital world, you'll have to really make software programs within the vast amounts of digital information for, for specific users. For engineers, it'll have to be difficult, uh, different. For, for, for medical people, it'll have to be different. For academia, it'll have to be different. Um, and so the real challenge is who is there to do those programs? And is India ready for that? You may have a pen drive with four million books, but the point is, and that's in Tamil literature alone, uh, but, the, but the point is that what are you going to do with that? So if I want to do research in a particular area, I would like you know, information that is relevant to me. And so can we in the process of digitization move towards developing programs through software technology which will allow us access uh, to the kind of use to which we want to put our research to. And if we do, if we do it, can this be, uh, um, can this be, can, will this be for profit or not for profit? And I think we need to look at some of these issues because we can actually enact laws to ensure that some areas are not for profit and some areas are for profit. So should it be open source or should not, not be open source? And quite frankly, the nature of libraries must also change. Uh, the nature of librarians must also change. Um, because the skills involved are, are, are entirely different. Uh, in other words, uh, librarians may actually have to outsource uh, answers to some of the questions that may be put to them in a digital scenario because they may not have those answers. So librarians will be perhaps more facilitators uh, than anything else. Um, and, and in fact, there should be a hybrid between uh, you know, a digital library and, and books. And, and, and you should have social interaction, you know, in places like that where you do have books as well, as well as digital library, and so that people can actually talk to each other and interact with each other. So I think the challenges 
are enormous. And I think that what this conference should do in the next three days is to look at those various challenges and actually see how we can develop the digital space in a manner that is user friendly. Now, I believe that there are five challenges that we're going to have to face as we move forward in this direction. Let me just spell some of them out. First, digital libraries will have to make tough choices about which materials to digitize, given that they must always try to make the best of their limited resources. Now, it's, you know, if you were to come to me as HRD minister, um, um, and you say, you know, I want to digitize these four million stuff, Balakrishnan, I'll say no to you. I'll say you have to go to the finance minister. <laughs> I don't have the money. And that's a real problem. I mean, governments can't be sort of paying out doles to just digitize. So you need to actually, in the, in the context of limited resources, you need to find out what are the materials you want to digitize. And that's an enormous exercise. That's not an easy exercise. Then digitizing archival materials is very expensive, it, it, including the costs of scanning, cataloging, maintaining access to materials. In addition, the choice of which print materials to digitize is also linked to the issue of which materials to discontinue. Because some materials are of no use. If you, if you digitize everything, you're adding cost. It is of no value. So that means there has to be application of mind. Now that's difficult in the Human Resource Development Ministry. <laughs> You'll have to help me out there. No, 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 just, this is in a lighter vein, I hope. <laughs> you don't think I'm serious about that. Now, <laughs> in addition to the choice of print materials to digitize, is also linked to the issue which materials to discontinue or discard in print form after digitization. Since some users prefer print resources, while other users prefer digital formats, it becomes difficult to meet the needs of all the users, requiring value judgments to be made in comparing physical and digital library services. This is point number one. This is the issue. Point number two. Secondly, traditionally libraries have used established taxonomies to organize collections. In the digital age, However, newer information resources have evolved, which can potentially challenge the authority of libraries and the classification systems traditionally used in libraries. For example, websites such as YouTube, Flickr, and others allow users to upload, organize, tag video images, and bookmarks. The activity of, the, of user tagging provides a form of foxonomy away from taxonomy. That is an alternative to centralized taxonomies. Foxonomies are potentially attractive to users due to the familiar way they can organize information as well as their flexibility and interactivity. So that's the second challenge. The third is digital libraries can also be sites for socialization, including interaction between librarians and users as well as among users. For example, virtual reference services are a primary means of interaction between librarians and users, and thus can be seen as an opportunity for more than just dissemination of information. So digital libraries can also have a community component, allowing users to play an active role in the development of the digital library itself. That's the third issue that actually we need to look at. Fourth. Frequently, digital libraries are treated as successors to physical libraries. But I believe there is advantages to have dual or hybrid libraries. In particular, the growth of digital libraries ought, might reinforce the need for libraries in general. And physical libraries can be used as physical spaces where users access digital libraries with both with both demonstrating the value of physical libraries for reading, computer use, and socialization. And last of all, libraries, both physical and digital, are now being challenged for their role as cultural institutions, primarily by for-profit websites. For example, commercial services such as YouTube and others take the same concept of storing and organizing information and give users more ability to control the information that is stored 
and how it is organized. And I believe that the big challenge will be of digital li libraries who don't have such systems in place. And YouTube, which has systems in place, users will naturally move towards YouTube and not to go to your digital libraries. So there needs to be uh, a process of or a development of a platform where digital libraries can also access that kind of platform uh, which YouTube has. Now, whether that you're able to do that or not, but that's a big challenge. Various websites also challenge important components of library services, such as sites like Yahoo Answers, which overlaps with reference services by allowing users to ask questions. However, the questions are answered by other users instead of librarians, often leading to not unemployment, but to a larger quantity of answers. Also, while library users traditionally had to visit physical libraries to look up information in encyclopedias, Wikipedia, Wikipedia provides a free and open way for users to seek information. Thus, it is important to examine how digital libraries respond to these threats to their cultural authority. Now, that's the fifth issue I wanted to place before you. So I feel that librarians will need to redefine their professional role especially when users themselves perform many of the functions formerly left to professionals. In the physical library, the librarian's traditional role as cultural custodian or as a cultural guide will be downplayed in favor of the librarian's function as an effective information disseminator, assisting in the user's development of information literacy. Librarians would need to act as facilitators of multimodal literacy and be more of a consumer guide assisting the individual user in making relevant choices amongst a plethora of seemingly equally confusing products. Their role must thus shift from a mediator of pre-established information sources to a partner in the creation of individual databases. This shift in paradigm requires that reference librarian training shift shifts its focus from a source orientation to a process orientation. The question then is how can multicultural and multilingual India realize this powerful vision of empowerment of communities through easy access of information and knowledge, which is presently available and accessible only to people from privileged communities and professionals, the corporate sector and school and college going children in urban areas. That's, I go back to my first point that I made, that we need to actually, uh, we can actually fast track our access to knowledge through digitization. And, and the quicker we really um, address this issue and reach millions of people who are starving for knowledge, who are hungry for knowledge, who are ready to do anything for access to knowledge and who have no access to knowledge. This is the revolution that will change the face of India. This is the re revolution that can come and we can hasten the pace of that revolution, not through legislation, Balakrishna, which I'm ready to work with you on, but uh, through having a, a social movement, uh, a political commitment, to ensure that the age of digitization will transform India uh, because it will give access to more than 500 million people who are less than 25 years of age into arenas and areas and spaces that they have never visited before. And a conference like this should apply, think about these issues, come up with solutions. And I'm sure that Terry and IGNU have done human service to bring all of you here to brainstorm for the next three days. If you have the answers, I don't know whether you'll find them this quickly, but we must work towards them because millions and millions of young people are waiting for the answers that you might have. Thank you very much.